thank you. So, if you're happy and you know it, as Dan said, it sounds like a simple instruction, right? All you have to do is just clap your hands. But if you think about it for another minute, are you happy? And how do you know it? It's 9 a.m. on a Friday. I mean, how happy can you really be? <laughs> now, when people hear that I work in psychology and I'm going to speak to them, they start to sort of reel back in their seats and avoid eye contact. They think that I'm going to read their minds. I'm not going to do that. I'm not that good. What I am going to do is I'm going to try to use what I understand about how your brains work to share with you a message that is relevant, interesting, and maybe even memorable. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about how I got to be here. My interest in psychology spurned from a chronic condition that I acquired when I was a little over two years old. It's called middle child syndrome. Does anybody have it? <laughs> <clears throat> now, middle child syndrome is a very common but poorly understood condition. And it's usually described as neglect from, or neglect, I guess, suffered when the parents fuss over their treasured firstborn and their cherished youngest child. I don't remember ever feeling anything but loved for my parents. I have to say that because my dad's here. <laughs> <laughs> And so my condition manifested a little bit differently. It started, I guess, with a little bit of torment at the hands of my brother. We were always forced to hold hands in pictures. I don't know why he did that to us. <clears throat> From a very early age, my brother would accidentally throw things at me, throw balls at my head in an effort to try and eliminate me, basically. Um, and so what I had to do was learn to catch. And I did. I learned to catch. And then I learned to throw these things back at him harder. And so what he had to do, I guess, as my sporting ability developed, was think of different ways to get to me. And so he turned to verbal, verbal forms of insult. And he would use articulate language and crafty insults to try to break me apart. But I learned to speak back. And so I guess that, in hindsight, was the emergence of my ability to think critically and to find flaws in otherwise logical arguments. Now, there was somebody else in this picture, <clears throat> my little sister, an hysterical, self-interested and non-compromising little girl. Trust me when I tell you that I was the only angel in this picture. <laughs> she used to, she, I guess, <laughs> in her non-compromising way, would rip the heads off all of my Barbie dolls and leave me with a series of decapitated little dolls to play with. And so from my sister, I learnt how to deal with people who weren't always behaving the way that other people do. I learnt to be rational. And so from my siblings, I learnt the two traits. I had highly developed sense of critical thinking ability and an extreme interest and understanding of human behaviour. And so it was probably no surprise that when I had the opportunity to write a thesis, I called it The Impact of Sibling Relationships on Adolescent Wellbeing. <laughs> it's still awkward having family photos together. It's a bit weird, <laughs> but we do it. But I wasn't done. And when I was 24, after I wrote this thesis, I was awarded a scholarship to write my PhD in the area of in psychology in the area of well-being, in subjective well-being specifically. Subjective well-being is the scientific term for what we understand as our general happiness. And the only caveat to my scholarship was that it had to be something in that area, anything I wanted. And so I started thinking about who the happiest people were that I know. And it didn't take me long to come up with my answer. This is a picture of my grandfather. I called him Zida. His name was Shimon Michalowicz and he was born on the 2nd of December in 1929 in a little town called Wielen in Poland. He was nine years old when World War II broke out. He was 10 years old when he was separated from his mother. And he was a little boy of just 11 when he stood in front of Nazi guards at Auschwitz. He was deemed eligible to work and he was transported to Blechamer. He spent some time there. And eventually he was sent on a death march to Buchenwald 
from where he was eventually liberated by the US Army on the 11th of April 1945. And I was struck by the irony that the person that I could think of who was the happiest was also the one who had suffered the most. And as I began to sort of look into the literature and the psychology of Holocaust survivors, I found that I couldn't connect with it at all. It was full of pathology. It talked about how people like my grandfather were irreparably and irreversibly damaged by what had happened to them and how they'd never be able to trust another human being again. But none of that described my Zyda. My Zyda made his way out to Australia. He created a new life for himself. He built a family. He loved to garden. He would plant things and watch them grow. He sang and he danced and he celebrated life. And the reason I tell you his story, I tell it to you for a number of reasons, but the main reason I tell it to you is because when people hear that I study happiness, they think that I sit in an office filled with unicorns and butterflies. <laughs> and it couldn't be further from the truth. Everything that I know about the study of happiness and about how we work comes from the study of trauma. So here's a question for you. What makes us happy? We all sort of have some sort of idea about what makes us happy, right? We know the things that are going to, or that we think are going to make us happy. For some, it might be thinking about a relaxing holiday, going on a relaxing holiday, even better. Might just be a cup of coffee. Might be that nice expensive bag we've had our eye on. Rolling around in money might be good for us. Spending some time with a loving partner. Maybe even adding kids to the mix. Actually, one of my favourite... Um, favourite findings of psychological research has to do, it comes from the parenting research and it's, um, uh, it, it tries to sort of, it's myth busters of psychology where they actually try to break down commonly held ideas such as the idea that kids make, having kids make you happy. When researchers have actually tracked the daily mood of parents, they find <laughs> that the happiest times of parents are the times when they are not anywhere near their children. <laughs> And what role does technology play in our happiness? More specifically, why in a world when we are more connected than ever before, are we also more lonely? So let's start by breaking down happiness into its two basic forms. The first type of happiness is short-term happiness. It's the type of happiness that we're probably most familiar with. The type of happiness that we feel in response to something good happening. So we take a bite out of a nice piece of chocolate and our mood goes up. Right? We all know that sort of feeling, but it doesn't last. The other type of happiness is a longer-term happiness. It's, more, it's the sort of happiness that, that we feel when we're not actually thinking about it at all. It's just there in the background, sort of permeating through everything that we do. It's more of an underlying sense of contentment. And that's the sort of happiness that we talk about in the literature and that I refer to when I'm talking about subjective well-being. Okay? Now, if that's what happiness is, I'm a scientist. We like to count things. We like to measure things. How on earth do we measure it? The simplest and the easiest way to measure it is by using a single question, and I'll put it to you now. On a scale of 0 to 10, 0 means you're not at all satisfied, and 10 means you're completely satisfied. How satisfied are you with your life as a whole? It shouldn't take you too long to come up with your answer. And I said I wasn't going to read your minds, but I do at this point just a little bit. Most of you, I'm guessing, would have said about a 7 or an 8. If you said anything much lower, I can give you some resources to contact afterwards. <laughs> We've actually been asking this question to thousands and thousands of Australians, over 60,000 in fact, over the last 15 years as part of a project that I've worked on called the Australian Unity Wellbeing Index. And the question has also been asked in, in many other countries over the world. And what I'm going to show you on this figure is the average score of the Australian population or of the sample that we get every time we measure it. So from 2001 to 2015, the little red line traces the average happiness score of the population. And what you can see is that it goes up, goes down, up again, up, oh, hits, a, hits a peak up there, drops back down there. Okay, and it, it travels along. 
what's really remarkable about this figure is that the average score, each little red point, is fluctuating between a very, very narrow range. If we're talking in terms of percentages, it's fluctuating between just 73.9% and 76.7%, which means that we can now reliably predict that if we take a random representative sample of the Australian population, their average happiness score will fall somewhere between that, that just three percentage point range. Now, when things are stable and reliable and predictable like this, it suggests that there's something underlying it to keep it that way. And the term that's used is homeostasis. So it's called, it's the theory of subjective well-being homeostasis. And the best way that I can describe it to you is by likening it to another homeostatic mechanism that we're all a lot more familiar with. So let's think for a moment about our body temperature. Our body temperature is set at 30, 37 degrees, right? Our body temperature can go up, we can get a little bit hot, our body temperature can go down, we can get a little bit cold. But what happens when that happens? What does our body do to respond? What happens when we get a little bit hot? What do we do? We sweat. Sweating is our body's natural response to try and cool itself back down. What happens when we get cold? We shiver. Shivering brings our body temperature back up. So we're engaging these natural, automatic, physiological processes to restore our body temperature to where it's meant to be. But sometimes those processes aren't enough. Sometimes our body temperature falls too far down or it goes too far up and then we need external medical assistance. So if we apply that same sort of understanding to our happiness, let's say that our happiness is fixed at a set point two. It's fixed at 75%. Our happiness goes up when something happens, but Automatic processes like adaptation, habituation, make us used to that feeling, we integrate it, and our happiness comes back to our set point of 75%. Our happiness goes down all the time. Things happen to, to make our happiness drop. But we engage in automatic psychological processes to bring us back up. So we might call on something like our self-esteem or our sense of optimism to make us feel like that bad thing is only temporary and it's going to go away. And so our happiness gets brought back up. But sometimes when those challenges to our ordinary set point level of happiness are chronic and persistent, our happiness can drop too far below and we're in need of external help. And so I talk about this 75% this set point. And the question that I always get is, but why isn't 100%? Why can't we be 100% happy? Happiness is good, right? So Shouldn't more of it be better? There's a large body of research that actually looks at the disadvantages of being too happy. There are research studies where they induce people into elevated positive moods and then look at the way they perform on a bunch of different tasks. And it turns out we're not very clever when we're happy. <laughs> we make all sorts of mistakes. We don't think as clearly or as accurately. We create false memories. <laughs> we perform poorly on other, on other cognitive tasks. We tend to trust people too easily. So socially, we're not as clever. And we become more selfish in social situations as well. So the idea, and I guess on the flip side, that there are advantages to being in a negative mood as well. So when people have a negative mood induced, they're more cautious, um, they perform better on tasks that require cognitive accuracy, and they're even more effective communicators. So, <clears throat> this whole idea that we're supposed to be at a certain level for our happiness makes sense intuitively, and it's sort of, it, it shouldn't be difficult for you all to understand. But why don't people want to accept it? Why do people think that we need to constantly be doing things to make ourselves happier? And so as a scientist, I am constantly frustrated by the way that happiness is spoken about online, particularly in social media. It's like we don't have the words or the language to understand happiness. So what we do is we get all these like nice fuzzy sounding words and we put them in pretty backdrops and we flood social media with it. 
seen this one? <laughs> I am in charge of how I feel and today I am choosing happiness. I'm sorry if any of you have ever posted this, <laughs> but I think it's absolute crap. <laughs> It is not as simple as just being able to choose how to feel. There are a lot of people out there, I'm talking about happiness, but there are a lot of people out there who find it very hard to be happy and who suffer from serious mental disorders or serious mental illnesses like depression. You can't take a person and you wouldn't take a person who had a physical condition. You wouldn't take a person who had who was bleeding from their leg, you wouldn't look at them and you would say, just choose to stop bleeding, right? It doesn't work like that. Psychological pain is real pain too and it doesn't go away by just choosing to be different. Here's something that came up on my newsfeed the other week and pissed me right off. Anyone see this one? I intend to fill Facebook with comic book superheroes to interrupt the saturation of negative images and videos. If you give me a like, I will choose a character for you. <laughs> Sorry, 10 people. Um, <laughs> the reason this bothers me even more than the other one is because what's happening here is somebody is saying, I don't want to hear your negativity. And in fact, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to instruct you what I'm going to allow you to express to me emotionally. And I'm only going to allow you, allow you, I don't want to hear your negativity, I'm only going to allow, allow you to be positive. And so when you do that, what I'm going to do in return is I'm going to give you a superhero because this is way more real than feeling negative. I'm going to give you Batman. <laughs> what all these things are trying to do and the reason they make us feel uncomfortable is because they're trying to artificially elevate our mood. They're trying to artificially elevate something that was never meant to go higher than 75%. Let's switch for a little bit and talk about how technology comes into play here in other ways. I, as a researcher, like to have large numbers of people to complete my surveys. And what technology allows me to do is get access to a lot of people that I wouldn't otherwise have access to. So I can collect data online. I can post a link to a survey on a Facebook or, um, or anywhere on a Twitter, and people can click on the link and access my survey and complete it. And it's great. More numbers means more statistically significant results most of the time. But there's a problem with these. Anybody heard of panel data or panels used in market research? Something? So panels are used a lot of the time. What they are, are groups of uh, panels are sort of held usually by market research companies. And what they do is they gather a large representative sample. So they'll get people to sign up to their panel, to join their panel and complete surveys for them. And these people have a demographically representative of the population in as many ways as you can think of. So gender-wise, geographically, um, in terms of their age, work status, education level, they represent the Australian population. And what these people do is they sign up to the panel, they join a panel, and they will complete surveys when they're sent to them for a reward. So it might be a dollar per survey, or it might be some sort of credit voucher that they can then um, substitute for something else. They're incentivized panels. What we find when we study happiness in these panels is that their average happiness score is not 75% like the rest of the population. Even though they may be representative of the population on every feasible demographic feature, they don't match in terms of their happiness. They're actually about 10 percentage points lower because the sorts of people who sign up to these panels are usually the type who are feeling stressed, bored, depressed, wanting somebody to talk to, and they want to do it in an anonymous way. So they'll join a panel and they'll tell somebody about it and then, hey, they'll get a dollar that they can use at Coles. <coughs> Another problem with these panel data has to do with the way that they're maintained. So some panels try to make sure that the people who are responding to their surveys aren't just going to go through and respond 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 to every question. Or good, 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 good. So what they do is they specifically eliminate participants who tend to respond in a way that we call acquiescent. The problem when it comes to measuring things like happiness and subjective well-being is that if everything is going right for a person, their happiness should be pretty stable. It should always be at about a seven or an eight. 
But if you're going through one of these questionnaires as a panel member and you're responding just a seven or eight to every question, you will get removed from the panel entirely. So these panel data are being used all over the world at the moment to collect data and published, um, publishing scientific articles on this. But we have to remember, and it's very important to remember, that sometimes these panels don't actually represent the population at all. Sometimes they comprise large numbers of people who are actually quite depressed. But we live in a world, and I've taken an old, an old psychological hierarchy um, here, and you can see what is most important to people these days is having access to internet, right, more than anything else. And there are large groups of the population who do use the internet a lot. Young people are one. And young people use technology in a way that is different to the adult population. The adult population still have a general sort of mistrust a little bit about the internet and about what it can do. Young people, not so. Young people feel safe online. They feel that they can connect and they feel that you can, they can use it as a medium to express themselves. So what we have here is an unprecedented opportunity to engage young people in a way that has never been able to be done before. In young people, suicide is the leading cause of death for those aged 15 to 24. But 80% of young males and 70% of young females suffering from some sort of mental condition do not seek help. Yet 99% of them are online daily. So there is, again, a massive opportunity to provide them with access to information, provide them with resources in ways that they can actually help them. So how can technology be used for good? Mobile apps are being created all the time to do different things that uh, in ways that you can provide feedback. So for example, things like that, uh, apps that allow you to track your mood or to monitor your mood, to keep a mood diary. You can use biometric devices like Fitbits to record all sorts of other activity. Um, you can use it to record physiological activity, which may be symptomatic of psychological conditions as well and feedback to the user. Through gaming, um, and Norman was just talking about gaming, gaming is huge, um, and a lot of people engage with games, and what we find we, in terms of use, engaging young people is it's actually more effective rather than developing new platforms to engage them, to actually integrate uh, mental skills training into existing games, put them into the ways that they're already using. And this is Ellie. Has anybody met Ellie before? Ellie is a virtual psychologist that was developed in the United States to work with vets, young vets returning from service. Ellie is programmed to detect subtle changes in eye movement and behavioural changes, changes in uh, speaking voice that may be indicative of underlying psychological conditions like PTSD. She can make diagnoses that are just about as accurate as, as real life clinicians. What she can't do is treat them. She can't provide therapy, but she can diagnose. And so for people returning, uh, for young vets returning home who may not want to be associated, I guess, with the stigma perhaps of mental illness, this is a great first step to engage them. I'm working now at the Young and Well Cooperative Research Centre, which is a not-for-profit organisation that works across government, academic, not-for-profit and corporate industries to explore ways that new technologies can be used to improve mental health um, and well-being of adolescents. And so what can you do? We're all going to keep using online media to express the way that we feel, understand that it is a huge platform and use it to understand others as well. I talked at the start, I gave you a bit of an insight into myself, a bit of self-awareness. Self-awareness is massive. And it's great to understand yourself, but more important than that is to understand how what you do and what you say impacts upon other people. And so I guess check in with yourself. Are you happy and do you know it? And if you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it, maybe doing it online isn't the best way to do it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>